Hi, everyone in the audience and those of you looking at me in the little box on your screens. <laughs> yeah, today I'll be talking about uh, remastering uh, natural earth, which is just kind of a fancy way of saying rebuilding it. And uh, yesterday we heard a lot about the 30 day mapping ch challenge and I was just kind of amazed that people were making all these beautiful maps in you know, two hours time. This project that um, I'm about to embark on with Nathaniel and hopefully some help from all of you, I can assure you is going to take more than two hours. I, I, I'm thinking of this as being more of a, a multi-year uh, project, but fortunately I'm retired and I need something to do besides gardening. So. Uh, this will keep me busy. Um, let me give you a little bit of background about uh, natural earth. I'm sure everyone's heard about it. Uh, it's, it's you know the data set that's been you know downloaded over um, 10 million times. You know, believe it or not, this data set that's you know so popular now it did not start off as a with a, a master plan. It grew kind of organically, and in the early uh, uh, 2000s, uh, me and Nathaniel were you know we're looking at ways to simulate Hal Shelton's natural color maps that he painted back in the 1950s and 1960s. We were playing around with land cover data and this, you know, mostly um, from the MODIS um, satellite combining with shade relief. And we came up with you know, this raster uh, natural earth data set that you see here. It's it buffered a bit out into the, into the oceans. We were uh, pretty pleased with it. It was a you know, cartographic you know, product that everyone could use. We we also wanted to create you know like a poster a map version of this that people could you know uh, you know display, and obviously it needed coastlines and and rivers and so you know where can we get these and this is back in the early two thousands, and uh, you know looking around at what was available there's some, there was something called VMap Zero a successor database to uh, Digital Chart of the World you know probably some of you are familiar with that it's kind of Kind of horrible. It's uh, it's it's poorly attributed. Uh, you know, it's uh, there's a million little little uh, line strings in it. Every one of those little drainages, every line string is disconnected, so you have to join them all together. Uh, and you can see that the density uh, varies from place to place. Obviously, I was not going to use this for um, deriving coastlines and and rivers. So, um, you know, following the, the path of least resistance, I turned to the CIA's uh, World Data Bank 2. It was a you know, worldwide uh, database developed in the, uh, the 1970s. Um, it was out there, it was available, you know, the, the, the coverage was about right, the, the generalization was about right. It's like, okay, let's just kind of go with this. And I used World Data Bank 2, put, you know, to put nice coastlines and, and rivers on, onto the raster data. And uh, it worked out, um, you know, pretty well. And you know what happened, you know, after developing this um, this raster data set, there was uh, you know a, a fair amount of demand for you know vector data to go along with it. And again, you know, following the path of uh, least resistance, um, you know, we we you know got these old World Data Bank two vectors and released those online. And, and then this kind of this movement started and, you know, you know, people were using this. We got lots of volunteers, almost, I think, 100 volunteers, you know, to, to build, you know, admin zero, admin one, you know, uh, populated places, roads, railroads, et cetera, et cetera, just a, an entire world uh, database. But the foundation of this, this thing, this uh, natural earth was not that great. It was based on 1970s data from paper, you know, digitized from paper maps. And, you know, here I am, I'm going to start dissing natural earth at this point in time. Um, <laughs> it's still use it at a certain scale. It's, it's perfectly fine. But, you know, here we are zoomed in to the, uh, the coastline of Patagonia and uh, Chile, this is the Tatao uh, Peninsula. And you, and you can see that, you know, the, the black lines show the existing natural earth coastline. And we can see a, uh, 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 a sentinel satellite image behind it. And you can see the coastline is off. Now, mind you, natural earth at one to 10 million scale, no one's gonna be navigating the fjords with it. But, but still, it's, it's always bugged me that you know, the, you know, the positional accuracy of natural earth is not as, as good as it um, could be. And I, and I have to tell you, there's, there's places on Earth that are worse than this. I mean, uh, northeastern Greenland is I don't know how many miles off. I 
100 miles off in some places. It's, it's, it's just absolutely terrible. Fortunately, not too many people map that area, so we haven't heard too many complaints about that. But it's not only the, uh, the coastlines. Uh, you know, the, the rivers are a bit sketchy as well. This is northwestern Canada. The, the, uh, the color image in the background is the Liard uh, River. And you can see that you know, the, the, the natural earth you know, drainages are not exactly on the river. And you might say, well, OK, so what? But think about this. If you're getting populated places and putting towns on this, uh, that town's not going to fall on the right bank of the river, or the, I should not say the right, but the correct bank of the river or where it should be. So, uh, you know, this has troubled me, and it's like, okay, I've got the time now. This might be um, a good time to rethink uh, natural earth and, and basically build it up from um, the ground up. So, um, I'm, I have this little diagram here. It's meant to look like a, a house or a building, you know, uh, and the foundation of you know rebuilding natural earth would of course start with the coastlines. That's kind of like you know ground zero, so to speak. And from there, you know, we would be you know adding lakes and rivers, and then you know admin zero countries, admin one provinces, and so forth, right up the line. You know, populate places. You know, everything is you know interconnected, obviously. So. You know, if, if we're we, if we're doing coastlines and rivers, we'd want to make sure that the country boundaries, you know, match that. So this is going to be uh, a Herculean task. I don't know what I'm getting into here. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about uh, coastlines. That's the, the first uh, uh, task to be done. And uh, if you were at the virtual conference last year, you heard um, Alex Tate um, talk about the National Geographic Cardo, Cardo Database 2.0 that they're uh, developing. Uh, Nat Case is in the audience. He's been working on on that on coastlines. Um, it's at one to 250,000 scale. And you know, one of the things that Alex mentioned is that it's going to be uh, releasable to the public. So it's like, okay, you know, the wheels started turning my mind. Just like, wow. Just you know, get the National Geographic you know coastline, downsample it to about one to ten million, and and use use that. Uh, that's contingent on a couple things. Uh, National Geographic legal needs to give the green light for that to happen. Um, Alex is looking into that, and it has not. You know, we haven't gotten any final word on that. And the, the other issue is some of the data that's going into the National Geographic um, uh, Cardo database coastline is uh, based on Creative Commons, you know, CC by, you know, what is it, 4.0. And the requirement is that, you know, the, the developer of that data and also all users need to cite the sources on every map that they make. So that could be a bit of a problem with a, a data set that's used for you know, making you know, maps of countries and what have you, you, the users, would then have to potentially list every source that went into making that. So um, our, our goal, if possible, is to have this entire you know, uh, new natural earth being entirely public domain so you don't have to put that paragraph of sources at the bottom. So what's the, uh, the alternative? Do it yourself. Um, I should say, do it myself, uh, at least initially with the coastlines. And um, you know, the the two um, vector coastlines that I'm now sort of investigating is World Vector Shoreline and Prototype uh, Global Shoreline. They're both in the public domain, uh, but both of them have problems. Let's take a look. Here's World Vector Shoreline, a product of uh, of, of NOAA. Uh, it's pretty good in some places, and really awful in others. Uh, you know, this is the uh, the northern, the Caribbean coast of Honduras. You can see the mainland coast, the continental coast, is you know right on the money. It, this is a uh, Sentinel uh, satellite image mosaic behind it. Then you see those those islands offshore. It's like what's going on there? And 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 this plagues world vector shoreline everywhere. So I mean, you have to make all kinds of positional changes to it. Well, how about um, prototype global shoreline from National Geospatial Agency? That you know, the the delineation of that in for high coastlines is generally right on the money. Low coastlines, there's a real problem. It measures the absolute high water mark. So we're looking at Delaware Bay here, and, and look where the shoreline is. Like all those inundated salt marshes, wherever the tide is sloshed up to the high water mark, 
it's showing as, as open water. So on low coastlines, it's not so good. Also, you know, look at um, you know Cape May. I don't know if my pointer is working here. I don't see. Uh, yeah, right there, Cape May. Some of those uh, those tidal um, lands are uh, you know you, you can see the causeways going out to the barrier islands. They have to be removed. So there's a lot of cleanup with uh, prototype global um, shoreline. So uh, I'm using um, various raster um, sources to uh, as as a reference for uh, basically redrawing the coastline in places. We've seen Landsat and Sentinel uh, data. Uh, Global Surface Water, a, uh, a product from the, uh, the, the European Commission is another source I'm using, and then digital elevation models from various uh, sources. Let's take a look at the, uh, the Copper River Delta uh, in uh, Alaska. This is at low tide. It looks like a delta, doesn't it? Here it is at high tide. This 15-foot tidal range there. Where is the shoreline? Here's Global Surface Water, kind of, you know, gives a good delineation of it. This is uh, 10 meter data of most of the world, but you can see that the high latitudes, including uh, the high Arctic and Antarctica are not included. But this is kind of my, my go-to reference for repositioning the vector data that I'm, I'm dealing with. And then I'm also uh, referring to you know, various high resolution digital elevation models that are out, out there. This is uh, Ellesmere Island in Northern Canada. And you can see that using this, this you know, this pretty good digital elevation model kind of shows you where the shorelines are. So I have this kind of like sandwich of different layers that I'm referring to when I'm trying to um, show this, this new uh, coastline. So let's look at a few coastline design and construction um, issues that I'm dealing with. On the left, you can see natural earth, uh, you know, as it presently exists at 10 million scale right now. The question is how much detail should this new version have? Nathaniel has told me that most users tend to uh, zoom in a little bit more than one to 10 million scale, so perhaps we need to add a bit more detail to it. I don't know if the, uh, the detail on the, uh, on the right is appropriate or not. Maybe it's a little bit too much, maybe it's too less. Uh, that needs to still be determined. Then this issue of smoothness. The one on the left is you know, kind of angular. But it's, it's a coastline. You think of it as sinuous and smooth. And so, you know, you want to maybe smooth it a little bit. But when you do that, you add lots of vertices to it. And that's an issue, too, because it it's just more computation for your computer. Oh, and then there's the whole idea of consistency. I uh, My early boy, boyhood was spent where that X is on Long Island. So obviously, I lavished attention on the coastline of Long Island. But would I do the same thing for Madagascar? Probably not. I'm not that familiar with Madagascar. So I'm kind of being mindful that, you know, okay, areas that you're familiar with, you might have more detail than uh, other places. Whole issue of aggregation. These are uh, some low lying islands off the uh, coast of Guinea Bissau in West Africa. And, uh, you know, how should you treat this? This is really zoomed in. You know, is it five islands? Two islands? Or just one big island? Um, and, uh, I mean, the good thing about me doing this entirely by myself is, you know, okay, I'll have in my head, you know, how to go about doing this and try to be consistent from place to place to place. But if I was to aggregate these islands, the three largest islands in there all have separate names. What do you do about the, about the names attributes uh, here? Do you include every island name? Do you just leave it off because you aggregated them? I don't really know. And I'd like to hear comments from all of you about you know, how to handle some of these issues. Oh, Louisiana. Uh, you know, most global you know, coastlines out there you know, have Lake Pontchartrain as part of the, uh, of the coast. But look at that. There's a, an obvious you know, choke point there and at that other place where I have the, the, the arrow. You know, where do you cut things off? I'm not really sure. Oh, small islands are another issue. This is uh, central uh, Cuba. And you can see all the Ks on, on the north and the south coasts. Uh, probably at the scale, we'd want to filter out most of the small islands. But we would not want to filter out those small islands that are in the middle of the ocean, like the mid-Atlantic, one of those little tiny little specks out there, because it's out in the middle of the ocean. But here, kind of close to shore, maybe uh, you know, more aggressive filtering would be uh, called for. And. Um, Alex also um, talked about uh, what to do about um, low-lying uh, shorelines where you have vegetation growing. 
you know, this is the, uh, the southern part of the Delmarva Peninsula. There's a lot of salt marshes there that are, uh, you know, uh, daily inundated by the tides. But there's, you know, there's sea grass and marsh grass um, growing there. It's green stuff. You know, mangrove swamps are another issue. And I'm, I'm following the, uh, you know, Alex's and Nat's uh, example here and, uh, and showing anything that has green vegetation growing is going to be land because it, otherwise it would just be too hard to determine where the coastlines are. This is my, uh, these are my coastline recipes. When I'm, you know, I'm doing all my tests, I diligently write down, you know, all, all of the steps that I'm doing. I'm using QGIS, Map Publisher, Adobe Illustrator, uh, MapShaper.org, just, you know, every tool that's available just to kind of fine tune these, these coastlines, uh, basically to my, to my liking. The, the yellow highlighted uh, step at six, uh, at that point, everything is Bezier curves and, uh, at this point, I'm using the, you know, the ref reference rasters and the pencil tool in Adobe Illustrator with my Wacom tablet, or I use my finger in the track pedal an awful lot too, to just to adjust the coastlines to uh, where they ought to be or where I think they um, ought to be. But I, I'm, it's very careful to keep you know, track of where um, things are. I've been uh, I've been you know uh, playing around with this a bit. I've I've kind of doing the Western Hemisphere first and you know, started in the, in the upper left and I'm working to the, the lower right and now playing around with Southern Patagonia. These are the areas that are in, shaded in gray that I've um, you know, actually accomplished that I have in Beziers right now and then we'll have to convert to straight line segments and, uh, and uh, onward from there. A little bit about Rivers Lakes and this is going to be very little. Uh, rivers and lakes will be the next step in this process. Um, over the last uh, couple of years, we've ad added supplemental rivers and lakes data for Europe, um, North America. Um, uh, Alex Fries is now working on South America, and he's going to be the next speaker. You're going to hear more about that. Um, I recently did um, Australia. So, you know, here's the existing um, Australian natural earth uh, data. <laughs> And here's the densified you know, rivers and lakes for this. That's fantastic. But the, the supplemental rivers and lakes are more accurate than the existing natural earth data. So all of that, we would have, basically have to do all the rivers and lakes in the existing natural earth data to a more accurate standard at some point, OK? So um, I'm going to be doing the coastline first. And then the, the next step is basically to do you know, all of the, the, the drainages um, of each continent. Um, as I mentioned, we got Europe, North America, and South America, and Australia kind of, you know, at least started at this point in time. But the, the biggies that need to be done are, um, you know, Africa and, wow, Asia. So, um, you know, <laughs> I'm looking at all of you and people out there in cyberspace, uh, you know, we're going to be looking for, you know, any volunteers who might want to um, tackle this. Uh, and uh, I tell you, Rivers and lakes are going to be more of a bear than coastlines are going to be, just uh, because of the uh, the sketchy data that is out there and how inconsistent it is from from place to place. But if you are interested in in doing this, you know, by all means, uh, you know, get in touch with me or Nathaniel, and we'll talk about uh, this. So at this point, uh, let me um, finish up. Thanks for your um, attention. Uh, here are some of the data sets that I uh, mentioned uh, in, in my talk. Also, um, I, I have been playing around with the coastlines, as I told you, and if any of you have an interest in seeing you know, these kind of provisional coastline uh, data that I've been preparing, let me know. I have my laptop here. I can show it to you. Anyone out there in, uh, out there in, the, in the broader world watching uh, virtually, if you're interested, get, send me an email, and I can share um, a, a shapefile with you, and you can take a look at it. So. Thanks so much, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Yeah, yeah no. Let me just want to mention the, uh, the U.S. has every uh, island shore of the Yeah, I mean, this, the, um, the, this NACES conference has been really great. Uh, Nat told me about this uh, USGS Islands um, shoreline uh, database that's out there. I'm going to need to check that out. That sounds like a fantastic uh, resource to use. Uh, Mark Daniel at the uh, U.S. Um, ICE Data Center, National ICE Center. Thank you, Mark. Uh, told me about a, you know a, a fantastic data that they have for Antarctica. It's all in the uh, in the in the public domain. Uh, I was just briefly peeking at it this morning. It looks 
very good and very usable, and I can't wait to get my hands on that. So that'll, that'll be a big help. Since these other databases don't really have high Arctic and, and, um, and, and, and Antarctic data on them. But thank you, Pat. Yes, Ken. What, what, what's the question now? So you right? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. I, um, the existing natural earth goes pretty far up rivers, and using that global surface water data set, I'm seeing that the coastlines are, you know, where it's salty versus brackish and fresh, are more close to uh, the ocean than what existing natural earth has, which means that the rivers are going to have to be all extended um, down to the coast very carefully, mind you, to follow those estuaries. But some are going to be very subjective. You know, where does the St. Lawrence River, you know, s you know s stop being an estuary and, and becomes a river? Quebec, Montreal, you know, how far up do you go? The St. Lawrence Seaway, I, it's that has yet to be determined. The Thames, for example, would be. Do you go to a Canary Wharf? Yes, some people are shaking their heads. Yes, no, I, I don't know. Um, but, you know, what... Uh, yeah. clearly the Okay. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> do, you, do you want to help out with this? I <laughs> <laughs> Sure you can. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the Hudson River is another uh, example of that. You, you know, how far up do you go from Manhattan? Do you go all the way up to the Tappan Zee? It, there, there's tidal influences all the way up to Albany. I don't know how far up that is. That's you know, 100 miles or so. Um, so, yeah, that's going to be something that I'll be grappling with. Yeah, Carl. Well, I mean, for the, the, the historical lake coastlines, like such as the, you know, the Aral Sea and, you know, I suppose the Great, the Great Salt Lake can be handed that way. And I think we have Glacial Lake Missoula, perhaps on there, Lahontan and so forth. Um, you know, they'll, they'll stay there. We might put some more details in there and add additional lakes. That was kind of a sort of an add on, um, database. It wasn't the primary one. But you know, you bring up the issue about you know, you know, uh, you know, human-made shorelines. I mean, there's been a lot of change. I understand, especially in East Asia, with you know, shorelines being extended out. You know, you know, it's happening in the Spratly Islands and so forth. Um, you know, we'll try to capture as much of that as possible. But mind you, this 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 database is going to be at one to ten million. So there, you know, the the width of the shoreline on your map is going to largely cover up most of that development. I suspect. Nathaniel. Ah, yes. Sorry, out there in cyberspace. Yes. Yes, yeah, so the question is, uh, do we have plans to add uh, additional, um, you know, coverages in, in natural earth? And the question is, they're there, the answer is, they're there already. So populated places and, and boundaries down to admin one, which would be, you know, states and provinces are, exist already. And you know, with this remastering uh, product, we would have to rebuild all of those, obviously. So yes, uh, that will be done. But this is this is going to be a long process. You know, don't expect it uh, next month. Yes. Yeah, that's that's a you know the question is you know um, or is this going to be open to uh, you know public editing such as like OpenStreetMap, and 
I, I think not. Uh, you know, we would, you know, welcome volunteers whom we would, you know, train and collaborate very carefully with. But the concern is, you know, you know, someone like myself who's familiar with Long Island would, you know, put a lot of detail into that. And what you end up with is, is this heterogeneous data set at some point where some areas are very detailed and other areas are very generalized. And you saw all of those issues that I was, you know, thinking about when, when creating this coastline. So, you know, probably not, you know, a open to all editing, but if, if people want to volunteer and, you know, follow some, some, you know, some pretty strict guidelines about how to go about it, we would certainly welcome that, that help. Yeah. Hey, thanks folks. Thank you.